Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Again, welcome uh, this morning to the Fort Worth Aviation Museum and the first organizational meeting of the Texas World War I Centennial Commemoration. I know we've got a lot of people here in the room who uh, are not familiar with each other, so let's just go around the room, introduce yourself, and tell us a little bit about what organization uh, you're here representing. And if it's yourself, that's okay too. Walt, let's start with you. Walt Leonard, I'm here for the Friends of the Royal Flying Corps. We do commemorative um, uh, shows for the uh, people who are buried at Greenwood and related to the uh, four flying fields that were operated by the Royal Flying Corps, the Canadians, and the Americans during World War I. Doug? Uh, Doug Harmon, I'm on with several of you, the uh, Tarrant County Historical Commission, and been involved in in uh, Fort Worth history projects for quite a while and and uh, very, very interested. Actually, one of my big uh, interests in, in this is to see a, a, a presentation of the history of Camp Bowie that, that the public can see. And so anyway, that's one of the things I'd like to Good. pursue here. Oh, we'll be talking about a lot of those kinds of things. Sheila. Sheila Doyle, I'm with the Vintage Flying Museum and uh, we're actually going to probably have a Replica Sopwith Triplane. Oh, great. Perhaps flying next year. Cool. Excellent. Right. Tyler. Uh, Tyler Alberts, Military Museum of Fort Worth. We, we have a uh, small museum over off 7th Street, and uh, basically our stuff is primarily dedicated to uh, soldiers' stories, individuals, so we represent those types of artifacts and their stories. We do a lot of outreach in the community, uh, uh, veterans' events, and various types of things in education. And if you haven't been to the museum, shame on you. It's, he's got a, I'm going to toot his own horn. He's got a great little museum over there. I'll get rid of that. I don't know what the, oh, Windows Update. We're not going to, we're not updating anything today. Restart. <laughs> no, no, no. Postpone. Postpone. There we go. Kent. I'm with the Tarrant County, Kent Knudsen. I'm with the Tarrant County Historical Commission. Carol. Carol Davis, I'm with the White Settlement Historical Museum, also involved with the White Settlement Historical Society, and I'm a member of uh, Dr. Murphy's Friends of the Royal Fine Court. Jenny. I'm Jenny Sweeney. I'm the Education Specialist at the National Archives at Fort Worth, and um, if we're supposed to talk about our organization, that's the National Archives. We do have a facility in Fort Worth, <laughs> a lot of people don't know that, and we've got a lot of great records that I think will be able to help with this. That. Jenny told me at the at the social studies conference that they have tons of photographs and documents from Camp Bowie and the three airfields here. Well, I don't know if there's tons from those places from the World War One era and okay. throughout Texas. Yes, okay. we have tons. But did y'all have more one? Uh, more than one location besides the one at Montgomery Plaza? We actually no longer have the location at Montgomery Plaza. Were you all in that? Well, we actually had two locations running for a while, that one, and then our other facility is actually um, at <coughs> 1400 John Burgess, which is um, pretty much between um, Alta Mesa and Everman Parkway out in that area. Um, and so it's out there. That's where we hold our original records. And so we have about 130,000 cubic feet of original mm -hmm. records um, from various um, federal agencies. And we're responsible for the states of Louisiana, Arkansas, <coughs> Oklahoma, and Texas. So um, <coughs> it's about 130,000 cubic feet of records. I can't tell you how many we have related specifically to this topic, but we do have quite a few. See, but that's tons. So. Yeah, it that's tons. Yeah. It sounds like tons to me. It, it, it is tons. Ben. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Gattery with the Fort Worth Aviation Museum. I look after the collections here at this museum and uh, do lots of other stuff related to uh, aviation in Texas. So, thanks. For we'll come back up here. Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Viscanage, uh, and I actually live in San Antonio, but do business here in Dallas a lot. But I'm a uh, I'm working with the World War One Centennial Commission as a volunteer, kind of at the state level, to work on uh, forming our state commemorative body and uh, before I met Jim and have seen many of your emails, uh, I'm very excited that, that you guys have this core of folks who are already doing stuff up here. So that's really helping helping drive things in terms of what are we going to do in Texas. So um, probably have been working for the last six or eight months just in doing the outreach for the program in Texas to the various 
stakeholders, everything from the museum world to the educational world to historical sites. So it's great to, like I say, hear of all the things that are already happening up here. How are you related to the Texas Historical Commission? I'm not related to the Texas Historical Commission. I started out as a volunteer with the World War I Centennial Commission at the national level, and that's how I became involved with helping for what we yeah, were doing in Texas. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're going to talk about all of this, but Mike is essentially the south portion of Texas, and we're the north portion, and he's also making uh, some inroads in Austin. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Alex. My name is Alex Durr, uh, artist. Uh, Ever since I moved here, I live off Cambuie. I wanted to do a painting of some uh, Canadian guys flying over Cambuie and stuff. And uh, so it's, it looks like it's finally time I can get started on that. Are you related to the German artist Durer? I don't think so. I, I've never really checked my genealogy or anything like that. Alex is also a, a, Alex is also a Marine and a pilot for American Airlines. He forgot that part. Tom. I'm Tom Kellum. I'm the district archivist for Tarrant County College. And we have a fairly extensive di digital collection on local aviation history donated to us by Don, who will tell you a little more about that when it's his time to, to talk. And we also have a, <coughs> an interesting collection from a family, the Bedeau family, from uh, Grapevine, uh, who was a French family that, that settled here, and a uh, Frenchman settled here and started a, um, a vineyard, actually, and he was a farmer, and probably was one of the earliest wine makers in Texas and all and, hit, and during the, the war uh, his family hosted the French uh, 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 tr Frenchman training at Camp Bowie and therefore we have photographs of them visiting his farm oh, and cool. the family visiting uh, Camp Bowie and you know some of the trenches and uh, it's, it's kind of interesting stuff so so we're looking forward to getting involved in this also I noticed there's nobody here from the Fort Worth Library they also have some interesting stuff, and I've right. worked there for about 25 years, and I'll see to it that they get Good. Good. That's part of what we're going to talk about, too, is communicating with other groups and organizations. Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel Crossley. I'm the director of GRTC Fort Worth Independent School District, and I'm here because ROTC is celebrating its centennial next year, uh, and unique with Fort Worth, we had GR ROTC, if you will, in 1915, the city council uh, voted in 1915 to establish it in Central High School, which is now Pasco. A one Mr. Wilson was the long uh, one who voted against uh, ROTC. That's a, another story. And so, and National Defense Act of 1916 formally established it. So we're celebrating across the country. And of course, in Fort Worth, we're going to do it big and to work with the centennial of World War One. I. I see a lot of synergy with that. Great. Thanks for being here. Clara. Uh, Clara Holmes for the Tarrant County Historical Commission and many other <coughs> historical commissions. I'll go out with Doug and we do a lot of projects and we're real thrilled to be involved in this one. And what she hasn't mentioned is uh, Clara's going to represent the tribes. <laughs> no, they don't know it yet. They don't know it yet, but she's already told me she's going to. That's and that's one of the districts that we're a part of, is uh, what is referred to as the tribe. So, Bob. Bob Holmes. Uh, I belong with Lady Clara there, of course, and uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, we uh, we do all of the uh, Texas historical and Fort Worth historical, and even we uh, kind of interested in the history aspect, even global. You know, we don't uh, we don't. We're part of the triad. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Corey. Hi. Hi. I'm Laurie Bevan and I'm the Executive Director with Imagination Fort Worth. And so what we do as an organization is provide innovative experiential educational programs to uh, students pre-K through 12th grade. And I have the great pleasure of working with Doug and Clara and Bob and Colonel Crossley. Anyway, I'm here to see where we might, and also the Aviation Museum. I'm Thanks. To see where we might pull something together and, and fit it in and, and get those kiddos um, to something great. We've got some great things we're going to talk about with that. There's some folders in the back, and if you want to sign in a name tag and grab some refreshments, you're welcome to do that. Don. Uh, Don Pye, I'm a resident historian here with Ben Guttery. Uh, also, historian for the B-36 Peacemaker Museum. I uh, started with them in 1998 when they were rebuilding 
Class B 36 over the pocket. Um, Tom mentioned the collection. I started collecting historic photographs, mainly the B 36 material, and donated a lot of things to him to display at the college. <coughs> and uh, we're just pushing on here. Good, and we're glad to have him. Uh, you're guinea pigs. This is the first time I've done this presentation, so we're going to hope that it all sequences in right. If I turn it on, it'll help. It'll help even more. Okay. We'll do it a different way. Ah. <coughs> Okay, now we got it. Now I think it's going to work for us. Okay, again, welcome. Uh, this is uh, essentially what we're going to be going over here this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, National Centennial Commission. Then we're going to talk about the uh, Texas Centennial Volunteer out Outreach, uh, potential commemoration activities, some of the resources, and then some of the next steps that we're going to take. Can everybody see this with the lights on, or would you prefer to turn the lights off? Okay. okay, good. Uh, this came out of uh, a book that was written right after the war, and this is the casualties uh, in, uh, in Texas, uh, with a total of 10,000. Uh, and it kind of goes through and it, and it lists all the different, uh, the different things. Died of wounds, died of disease, killed in action, um, drowned, uh, one suicide, or a couple of su some suicides, some homicides, uh, some presumed deads, uh, prisoners, all kinds of things. Comes up to a total of uh, uh, of just over 10,000 casualties. Is the diet of disease, that's the influenza? More than likely, yeah. No. Yeah, more than likely. So let's see if I can get this to run. How's everybody's history on the First World War? Let me see if I can... Uh, Most of the people here were there. <laughs> <laughs> The politics of 19th century Europe were messy. What's changed? It was made up of various empires spreading across the world trying to show each other who was the biggest power. They each built up massive armies to stave off war thinking that everyone else would be too scared to fight against them. Or so they thought. Things all changed when a gang of Yugoslav nationalists who didn't like being part of Austria-Hungary shot the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand while he was in Sarajevo. Swiftly, the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia. Russia came in to aid Serbia, so Germany decided to declare war on Russia. Knowing that France would go to war with Germany, Germany decided to attack France quickly and invaded via neutral Belgium and Luxembourg, and because of this, Great Britain stepped in to stop the Germans getting any closer. It was a mess of allegiances and old rivalries with two sides forming, the Allies and the Central Powers. And so began what became known at the time as the Great War, the war to end all wars. A new form of warfare evolved as these fully industrialized armies with engines, machine guns, airplanes and new chemical gas weapons fought against each other. It was the dawn of modern warfare. At the time, national pride was at an all-time high and men were proud to go off and fight for their country. It was seen as a romantic idea to go off and be a hero. Boys as young as 12 managed to lie their way into the army ranks, only to discover that it was not such a sweet and honourable thing to die for one's country. Germany marched on Paris, but was stopped by the French, and both sides dug themselves into trenches on what became known as the Western Front. On the Eastern Front, the Russians invaded Austria-Hungary, but were stopped in Eastern Prussia by the Germans. The Ottoman Empire joined in on the side of the Central Powers in 1914. More and more nations from all over the world joined the fight as the war spread across Europe. Trench warfare was quite terrible. Each army would dig a long network of trenches in the ground, fortifying the front with barbed wire and sandbags. It was a long stalemate where neither side dared advance on the other. Machine guns were a new and very effective weapon. When the time was right, the army would climb up over the top and charge across no man's land to the enemy trench and capture it, thus gaining more land and taking another step towards their goal. At least, that was the plan. Spirits were high at least when the first Christmas came by. Both forces climbed out of their trenches to celebrate Christmas together and talk, share stories and play football. When Christmas ended, they would climb back into their trenches to become enemies once again. Conditions in the trenches were dreadful. Soldiers in France and Belgium found their feet rotting away from the constant damp. In contrast, Australian, New Zealand and Ottoman soldiers fighting in Gallipoli had blisteringly hot trenches where rain and cold were replaced with dehydration and overheating. Disease was everywhere in the trenches. 1916 saw a renewed push on the Western Front from both sides. Thousands of French died at Verdun as the Germans unleashed their chlorine gas. The infamous Battle of the Somme was a 
long and grueling battle that lasted from July to November. The first day alone saw over 80,000 men wounded or killed, mostly British due to disastrous attacks. Fundamental errors and contradictions from the high command led to confusion and unclear plans. In places, soldiers weren't organised in time to charge, so by the time that they got going, the artillery had stopped firing on the Germans, allowing them to easily fire upon their attackers. Planes and artillery were supposed to clear the German barbed wire, but the shrapnel was ineffective against the wire. When the order came to go over the top, thousands of men ran out to their death to be caught on the barbed wire and picked off one by one by the German machine guns. This battle saw the first use of tanks by the British. Ultimately, France and Britain pushed against Germany and gained much ground. By Christmas 1916, no man wanted good cheer wished upon their faceless enemy. During 1916 also, before the Somme, Irish Republicans staged an uprising in Dublin in the hopes to catch Britain while they were distracted by the war. It was crushed by Britain, but after executing the rebel leaders, Irish support for Britain and the war dropped, at least in the south of Ireland. Most Irish troops after that came from the Protestant north. On the sea, Britain mined many patches of international water to stop movement of German ships. Germany was blockaded. After many naval battles, Britain tried to stay in control of the seas, above the water at least. Germany were on the attack with the U-boat submarines, adding a new dimension to naval warfare. They could attack without warning. They sank many ships, including the ship the Lusitania, and because this broke loads of war rules, it ultimately influenced the United States of America to end the war, two years later. The British pushed up through the Arabian Peninsula with T.E. Lawrence, a.k.a. Lawrence of Arabia, helping to organise the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire. In 1917, the Russians had a series of revolutions. In the February Revolution, the Tsars were gotten rid of, but Russia remained in the war. In the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks took control and brought power to the people and sowed the seeds for communism in Russia. The Russians signed a treaty with Germany and pulled out of the war, causing an initial difficulty for the enemies of the Central Powers. The Allies, however, became refreshed with reinforcements from the United States of America, who eventually decided to enter the war in 1917, after Germany tried to convince Mexico to attack them. Germany made a fierce and effective push before the Allies could use their advantage. However, American troops continued to arrive in such great numbers that Germany's army couldn't last any longer. The Allies pushed up from Italy, the Balkans and the Middle East, putting Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire out of the war. As the Allies advanced the Western Front, Germany called for an armistice to stop the fighting, bringing victory to the Allies and an end to the war. The fighting stopped on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918. It took six months to negotiate terms and it was ultimately decided that the central powers were to pay for the damages they had caused in the war. Germany only fully paid off this debt in 2010. The map of Europe was redrawn. Soldiers who made it home again were changed men. They were haunted by the horrors which they had seen in the trenches. Gas attacks, friends dying by their side and the constant shelling of enemy artillery. They were shell-shocked and so many found it impossible to go back to normal life after the trenches. Many great poets and writers were inspired by their hell in the trenches, such as Wilfred Owen, J.R.R. Tolkien and Ernest Hemingway, of the so-called Lost Generation. Some survived, many did not. The world was a changed place after the World War. People had seen the death and destruction that could be dealt by mankind. The men who left to become heroes came back scarred, or worse, never returned at all. The poppy is used to remember the millions who died in this war, as it was just about the only flower to grow in the carnage-ridden wasteland between the trenches. The world was now a darker place. People hoped that it would indeed be the war to end all wars. Unfortunately, they were mistaken. If you like this video, please subscribe review and you can follow me on Twitter everybody. at John D. Ruddy Actor was for or find me. me on Facebook. Okay, so I'm going to just leave it at that. Uh, so the U.S. World War uh, World War One Centennial Commission, and you've got the blue sheets in your folders. Uh, give you more information about that. A lot of that information is stuff that Mike put together and has been uh, sending out to people. But Congress created the, uh, the Centennial Commission in uh, 2013 with these charges. Ed educate the Americans, honor uh, the people who have no voice, commemorate uh, veterans and provide leadership, and build a World War I memorial uh, in Washington, D.C. Of course, there's no funding that went with any of this. Who is on the commission? Is there anybody from Texas on the commission? Uh, the, well, the, the, the United States are divided up into about eight different states. Eight different sections. Yeah, and it's, it's a, there, there are a number of um, commissioners that have been appointed. Uh, some were requested to be appointed by certain entities, such as the VFW and the American Legion, have a uh, each have a commissioner. The other commissioners were presidential appointees, typically, 
and we're responsible for some number of states. It's not clear in particular geographic region. For instance, there isn't a commissioner who's responsible for the western states. It's for a mishmash of different states for each commissioner. Our commissioner, who is uh, <coughs> Major General uh, Alfred Venezuela, uh, and our district is, uh, let's see, it's Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and Puerto Rico and the tribes and Oklahoma. Yeah, it's California. Too, yeah, some, something like that. I mean, it's just really kind of a kind of a patchwork on this thing. So, our job is to. Uh, oh, first of all, why does the war matter? Why do we even want to commemorate and, and those types of things? Over four million Americans were uh, were served in World War One. Uh, the Great War changed everything. Uh, it began the American century, and it uh, put America on a path to becoming a superpower, and it set the stage for the rest of the wars. There are a lot of documents and the resources and things that can help you with any of this stuff. There's one that's called just Talking Points, and it's a single page, and, it, and it's good information to be able to have to hand out. I've got a copy of it here, and I'll pass it around. We can look at it later. Uh, Texas and the Great War. I pulled out some numbers here just so we could get a feel for uh, how Texas was involved here. We had almost one million men who uh, registered for the draft. Uh, and then we had almost 200,000 serve. That included some women, nurses. And uh, uh, a total of uh, just over 5,000 died. Uh, one third of these occurred in the U.S. Uh, due to accidents, but mostly due to the Spanish influenza. And then by comparison, so you can get an idea, if you take a look at this, we were only in the war about 18 months. And so this, uh, this comes out to be about two people a day uh, that, were, that were killed. As opposed to World War, uh, World war II, many more casualties, but we were in there for a much longer time, and that was about five a day. But now the other wars, when we look at uh, Korea, Vietnam, and uh, even the war today, they pale by comparison to the number of casualties on a daily basis for the period of time that we were involved in these things. So it was really, it really impacted uh, Texas quite largely. And here's our mission uh, th for the states, is to establish a commemorative body at the state level to coordinate with the National Commission. Mike mentioned a little bit about this. What, uh, <clears throat> what this is being done in other states is state legislatures are, uh, are creating this, uh, this commemorative body. And there's only, what, about five states right now so far that have those. Uh, and of course, our legislation missed that this year. They won't meet again until 17, which is a little bit late. So Mike has been working with some people in Austin to try to get an executive order from the governor to establish our commemorative body here in the state of Texas. In the meantime, we are all part of the volunteer outreach that's going to go ahead and start planning things. Uh, plan commemorative events within Texas and increase awareness of the, uh, of the role of Texas, Texans, uh, and a number of other things. There's a lot of stuff here that we can deal with. Now this is the map of the United States, and it's a little bit hard to tell, but red means that there's very little activity. I'm going to use my Mac for the one this afternoon. I don't have these issues. Go away. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is color-coded. Uh, red means that there's... Uh, Jesus. Uh, red means that there's very little activity. Uh, the light green is moderate activity, dark green, and, and all the, these different color codes. So this is in September. What in the world? Oh good, it's restarting. While it decides to restart, what I can tell you is just in the two months from September until today, We've gone from being a red state, and we are now a green state. And that's in large part because you folks are in this room. It's because of the work that Mike's been doing down south, and because we started to, uh, to pick up on some of this. And so that <clears throat> in large part, we have turned green here because of the activity in your interest. And it's only going to get bigger, <clears throat> bigger from here. Wow, this is... Can I suggest that on the, to get it greener, Yes. The, uh, uh, several of us are very involved in the, in the regional heritage programs of, of Texas, right. which is under the Texas Historical Commission. And John now has become the chairman of it, and he is the, he owns Budweiser or Houston. So he's a very powerful man, and uh, 
he was kicked off the commission uh, as chairman because of the conflict with Governor Perry. He's back on it. And he is very, very interested in military history. He was very involved in, in the, uh, the attention paid to the Civil War and the Civil War Museum, or the Civil War brochure came out of it. I, and, and they're having the commission meeting is coming up uh, something we should do. Yeah. That, that's great, and, you know, as, the, as things work, what the use, you yeah. know, uh, on the board is, is mentioning it, that it's probably going to get a whole lot more. Because I can take this information, I think, and maybe get that on their agenda for the next meeting, actually. I'm not sure that well, we yeah, we're going to rock for you, whatever. Yeah, we're going to. Uh, this is, I'm going to do something different this afternoon. Uh, but uh, the big point is that we've gone, uh, we've gone green here in the state. And uh, what we're going to want to be doing is, is essentially three things. We're going to want to be uh, communicating with each other and other groups like, uh, like Doug, Doug is suggesting. And then coordinating our activities over the next few years. And then, uh, and then do the commemorations. The first, uh, anybody want to take a guess on when the first activity of the First World War took place here in Texas? Then we invaded uh, Mexico. Just before that, actually. It's, uh, the, the centennial for us is next week. It's November 20th of 1915 is when the first Aero Squadron came through Fort Worth yeah. on the way to Fort Sam Houston before it went down to Mexico. And so for us, it starts a lot earlier. Not much took place in 1916, although the Texas Guard went down to Mexico and, and all the rest of it. So there were activities that took place before we actually got involved in, in 1917. Um, That's when they were landed in Ryan's pasture. Right. Yeah, they landed in Ryan's pasture and yeah. spent a couple of days here. Um, so one of the things that we're going to do here as far as national commemorations are concerned is uh, they want to build a memorial. There is no memorial for the First World War. Uh, there is in Kansas City. Kansas. There is in Kansas City, but that's the museum. Okay, and the museum is, is really good, but they want to have one in Washington, D.C. They're looking at using Pershing Square. Uh, for the for the new memorial, so there's an effort to to raise funds for that and redesign it. In fact, the the competition for the new uh, the new memorial is uh, already in place. Because the more one monument that they have there on the mall is for the D.C. citizens, right? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. But uh, in Pershing Square, they're going to redo that, and apparently, there's a lot of people who have problems with that issue. Um, another one is the World War One Memorial Inventory Project. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, partly. Uh, I'm sorry, the Monuments Project. They want to try to get a, uh, get a listing of all of the monuments in the United States, memorials and monuments in the United States towards World War I. Uh, there is no national listing. It's interesting when I talk to the people uh, from the World War I Museum that there's also not a national listing of the casualties from the war. The states have individual ones, but there is no national list of the casualties for the First World War, so that's another thing. So part of it is going to be locating monuments, doing some restoration work on them, uh, where, that, uh, where that may fit in and, and a number of other things. Um, uh, Veterans History Project, the, uh, um, the, Nash, or the uh, Library of Congress, and I'll show you some examples as soon as everything comes back up here. Uh, but the, uh, the Library of Congress has a veterans registration project and you can go in there and you can add records to it. Uh, you can also look up and see what's, uh, what's in there and listed. Uh, interestingly enough, right now if you go in today and look up uh, Texas and World War I veterans, how many people do you think you're going to come up with? How many names? 200. 200? Good guess. 44. That's all that the Library of Congress has listed for Texas is 44, and they're not all Texans. Many of them are people who are from different states and served here in Texas during the First World War. So this is one of these grassroots kinds of things where we can uh, uh, we can help out uh, help out a lot. Uh, Jim, yes, uh, the first one that you mentioned. Yeah, a simple thing. It would seem to me for the uh, those of us on the Tarrant County Historical Commission mm -hmm. is to simply make that one of our project sure. to identify all the markers of Tarrant County that relate to sure. World War One. Yeah, and it's a, and that's part of a national project too, so we can we can combine in and, and hook into uh, hook into some of those. Um, let's see. Oh, and here's another project that uh, has been brought up uh, that they want to try to do is a, a tolling of the bells. 
on 11 11 of 18 at 11 o'clock in the morning so a tolling of church bells or just bells in general across the united states as uh, as the uh, centennial comes across for 18. <coughs> Yeah, uh, let's see. Well, since I'm handicapped here, I'm going to move on to the next thing. I have here, and there have been many, many ideas about things we can do. And so I've prepared some sheets, and I just didn't want to give them to you ahead of time because you'd be reading them and wouldn't be paying attention. Uh, I've done this. I've done this before. Uh, Doug, if you'd take one of these and pass it around. What I'd like us to do is uh, is take a. We'll we'll talk about these here a little bit, but then we can break up into a couple of groups and discuss some of these ideas and see what kind of resonates with people and what they think might be a good idea from around here. And uh, and then we'll just uh, we'll move forward with some of these. But here are just some of the ideas that have come up in general discussions. Uh, art exhibits, World War One art exhibits. Uh, Tyler's got an idea that he wants to do for Camp Bowie, putting up pictures in people's uh, people's yards of what uh, what their house looked like or that area looked like uh, during the war. Uh, collection programs. There are some great collection programs, and they're, they're referred to as community collections. And, uh, and Europe has been doing this now for a couple of years, so they've got a head start on us, and they've done a lot of work that we can uh, just piggyback on. But one of them are called Community Collection Days, where uh, you set up a time where veterans can come in or families can come in and bring in and tell their stories and bring in, uh, bring in their, their material. The State the Library in Connecticut has a program that they're doing that they wanted to try to connect the generations with the generations of today with, uh, with the generations of yesterday. So what they have been doing is they found that the, the children of World War I veterans are eager to tell their stories. Of the, their parents' stories, and they don't have any place to do that. So in Connecticut, what they've been doing is getting middle school kids and high school kids to do the oral histories with these families. And they bring in their parents' material, uh, talk about their experiences that they heard when they were uh, when they were kids growing up with their parents and those kinds of things. So there's, uh, it's a re that's a really exciting project. The community collections are similar to that, where you set up a day at a different at certain places and you come in and you collect oral histories, uh, take. Uh, take photographs or scans of documents and pictures. You're not trying to collect things from people, but what they've found across the country is that when you do this and people find out that there's somebody who is interested in their family's materials, that they are willing to turn it over to, uh, to an organization or a group. There's a story about one, uh, one family that uh, they reluctantly uh, provided a diary from uh, from one of their fathers or grandfathers who'd been in the First World War. Uh, it had been in the family forever. They donated the uh, they donated the diary, and uh, a couple of months later, their house burned down and they lost everything. And had they not have turned the diary over, the diary would have been lost too. Uh, culture. How did one of the things that Mike and I have talked about a lot is not just the people and their military experiences, but how did the First World War impact the culture of the, of the area here? You know, there were changes in medicine, there were changes in technology and education. The schools exploded around here. They were looking for teachers for, for the schools they couldn't find enough. The economy of this area went crazy for a while. They couldn't find enough people to do all of the work that needed to be done. Uh, things like the stockyards. I mean, we've all been talking about the stockyards lately. The stockyards had the responsibility of coming up with the remounts and the cattle uh, for the army here at Camp Bowie. So that was huge. And I know uh, Teresa is, um, is doing a display down at, uh, down at the uh, North Fort Worth Historical Society on just that, what the stockyards were, were doing during that. Uh, I think we ought to look at kind of uh, trying to set up some kind of a daily calendar as we move forward. What were the economics here in Texas? How did the how did the war affect the economics here? Uh, education, graves identification. Uh, I made the announcement to uh, Betty Porter because she was having a and she's with the Tarrant County Historical Commission. Um, she was having a cemetery workshop, and I said, "Why don't you just let your people know that we'd like to try to identify World War One graves here in the area?" And people have been sending me stuff. Don's been sending me pictures. Other people have been sending me locations of folks. Uh, when I went to Greenwood and I asked there, I said, how many World War I veterans are here? And they said, well, we've got this little plot of the, of the flyers. And I said, well, yes, but I mean, how about in the rest of the cemetery? And they said, well, we don't know. And I said, so the only way we could learn is just going out and marching through the cemetery. And his eyes kind of rolled when I said that. But I said, uh, but 
that's the only way we're going to find out with some of these cemeteries. And I've already got a, a list of uh, maybe 100 people that are buried here locally. And I think it would be really interesting that maybe for 17 or 18, we go out on Veterans Day and mark all those graves, like we uh, like are done with some of the others. Uh, changes in medicine. There were a lot of uh, a lot of advances in medicine. And as somebody said with this whole war in general, uh, they rode in on horses and they flew out on airplanes. So the technology of just uh, of, of just war. Um, we can do modelers contests. Somebody is doing, a, not here, but somebody in one of the states is doing a modeling contest where the modeling clubs in the area are building dioramas uh, with, uh, with the small figures. Uh, monuments registrations, we talked about that. Uh, there's music from the First World War. We could do music festivals. Uh, the oral histories. There was poetry. They talked about that in a little little deal here. Uh, reenactors, uh, reenactors encampments. I've been involved in some of those over the years. It's very big with the Civil War, and it's also now uh, fairly large with uh, the Second World War and even some of Vietnam. I was at an air show in Houston. They had an encamp in a, a World War II encampment at there. You don't see anything from the First World War. As I mentioned to somebody, we were in the parade the other day, and there were representatives there from the Sons of the Revolution and uh, the, uh, the Civil War and World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Desert Storm, Desert Shield, but there was no representation of World War I in the parade, and I think that's something we ought to be able to change. Uh, there was theater, theater that took place. Um, and then there's veterans records, and I think we can do a lot with, uh, with veterans records. So these are just some ideas, and so what I'd kind of like us to do right now for a little bit, uh, we've got three tables out there. If we can break up into, into three groups or four groups or whatever, some people can stay in here. And let's talk about some of these ideas or other ideas that you have or people that you think might be interested in being involved in this, in this project. As I envision it for North Texas, I see us doing a few things next year in 16. We're going to have a presentation here next Saturday on, on the first Aero Squadron coming through, uh, coming through Texas. But I'd like, to, I'd like to think next year in 16 that we can do maybe three or four kinds of activities through the year. And then in 17 and 18, I think with enough different groups that we have here, uh, if each group would take one month or two months over a two-year period, and that every month we have some kind of a World War I activity going on, some, some type, whether it's a film festival, think of all the films. There, TCU has a film festival, and I'm, uh, I'm talking to them about picking one of those years, and maybe their film festival will be a series of World War I related movies. So lots of things. And I think if we do this all together as a, as a group and we each take a little piece of this, it'll be manageable. But this can become a very large monster. And these are just a few ideas, and I'm sure there's lots more ideas here too. So anybody have any comments right now before we break up for a few minutes? Yeah, Jenny. Are you going to share with everybody like the list of the people that are here in this afternoon so that as we Absolutely do not. I'm going to just can... keep it all to okay. myself. <laughs> no, I absolutely will. Okay. Uh, we, we're going to have to come up with some method of communicating with everybody because the group is growing on a daily basis. It, I mean, it just really is. And uh, there's a lot of things in terms of, of resources and websites and places you can go. We don't have to invent much. Uh, most of the stuff that we need or are going to want is already out there. It's simply a matter of knowing where to go for it. So yeah, we're going to have to do something with that. We do have a Facebook page. If, uh, if any of you are on Facebook, it's Camp Bowie World War I. Ben set, that, ben set that up. And we can use that as a springboard for a lot of the things here. You know, yeah, Doug. One, one thing I think to be aware of or uh, sensitive to is, is kind of the advanced timing. For example, um, I'm involved with the uh, the library, Fort Worth Library, and the uh, I was at their meeting yesterday of the foundation. And I mentioned this at the meeting. Good. But one of the biggest exhibit display places places we have in the city is that uh, display area of the library, mm -hmm. and that gets scheduled pretty far in advance. And I think we need to, you know, that's one where we right. need to put something kind of in their calendar about. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree that it's a it's a big space, and they have they also have uh, uh, display cases. Right. Yeah. So you could you could have uh, wall art and artifacts. And this is where it's going to be important that we communicate and then coordinate together. 
I don't have any specific contacts at the library. You know, I've got uh, contacts at the archives. This afternoon's group is going to be about the same size as this, but I know Dawn Young. Dawn Youngblood's going to be here from the Tarrant County Archives and, and those kinds of things. So that's going to be the issues, communicating with each other, coordinating activities, finding other people who can do things so that we don't have to invent something. And then doing what we can to uh, to publicize it and and get buy-in. Uh, I know uh, uh, we've talked to the uh, Fort Worth Independent School District, and uh, and they're very interested in uh, in in working with us. Joe uh, uh, Nitzella, who's the head of the Social Studies Department there. So we've got a lot of buy-in from some people. So it's going to be a matter of coordinating and, and doing some long-range planning too. So. Well, one of the things, for example, in downtown. Uh, been involved with the uh, Heritage Trail. Okay, and right. To, to get one of those markers down there, you know, it takes kind of months of planning. But, you know, downtown, the uh, Royal Flying Corps had their office downtown. So I think one of the things that we might want to get kind of on the on the calendar is doing something downtown where you've got a lot of foot traffic. And uh, so I think, you know, whether, you know, we aim to have something in you know, in 18 or 17 or whatever. Right. That we need to right. push that now. Okay. Let's for right now, let's break up in about three or four little groups. If you want to have some people want to stay right here, and uh, we've got some tables in the back, and let's go ahead and go over the yellow sheets. Any ideas that you've come up with? This is free form. So just uh, some ideas, and if you've got some contacts or things, and then we'll kind of just bring this all together uh, after the meeting this afternoon, and we'll see where we go from here. Oh,